Stephen, you came down to USC with uh, Sugarland Express. Right. And Bob and I remember sitting there in a screening, and then the director gets introduced, and you come out there, and Bob and I were looking at each other. This guy isn't, he's barely any older than we are. <laughs> and, he, and he made this movie with all these police cars. And then I remember you two guys coming to my office at Universal when I had one of those little bungalows, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you came packing. Mm -hmm. With a film called Field of Honor, right? I buttonholed you after that after that screening, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I, you were trying to get out of the out of the theater at USC, and I said, "Hey, I got a student film. You want to come see? You know, see my film?" But you were great because you set up as a screening room, right? And right. ran the movie, and you liked it. I loved it. I loved it because you used one of my favorite scores, Albert Bernstein's "The Great Escape" throughout the whole thing. That's right. And, and, right. and the film was audacious. It was audacious. Yeah. It was also what John Milius would come to call socially irresponsible. Right. And right. in those days, social irresponsibility was what attracted all of our attention. <laughs> yes. And Absolutely. it was it was just a film made by two cinematic anarchists. Get the hell out of my swimming pool. It was definitely inspired by Clockwork Orange. Yes. Yeah, movies like that. From the greatest cinematic anarchist in the world, <laughs> Stanley right. Kubrick. That's right. That's right. So following those footsteps. So then we stayed in touch, mm -hmm. right? You went off and made Jaws, mm -hmm. and Bob and I pitched 1941 to John Milius. Right, right. And he hired us to write the screenplay. And then you came back from Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard. Your movie came out. You became a famous director, and Milius, is Milius gave you, you the, the script, script for 1941. These two insane guys, were. right? And you said, "Well, I got to read this," <laughs> and it was socially irresponsible. Uh -huh. uh, and we had all this stuff in there, like the dogfight over Hollywood Boulevard, That's right. and the Ferris wheel rolling down the pier. Mm -hmm. And this was all the stuff that the studio people were saying. Well, you guys, the, nobody could film that. Nobody could film that. And that's exactly what attracted you to Well, when it. I read the script, it was like walking into a caddy store of massive destruction. <laughs> Just everything I used to break as a kid, I would have a chance this time somebody else to pay for for me to break on screen. Because you broke so much stuff. I mean, you destroyed every set right. in the script gets somehow trashed, right? right? Yeah. Everything. Right. And, and in, in that time of my life, in my life, Mm -hmm. uh, not being a dad, not being a husband, just being a filmmaker, I just thought this was going to be right. one of the most fun experiences I right. could possibly have. Yeah. And so then uh, you decided you wanted to make that movie. Right. And so then you were making Close Encounters. Right. And you... Uh, I was wanted... prepping 41 while I was making Close right. Encounters. Right. So you, sent mm -hmm. you, you, you brought us down to Mobile, mm -hmm. but before... put us in your house. Remember that. And, but, but before that, we had come up with the idea of writing I Want to Hold Your Hand. Mm -hmm. Bob and I were sitting over at my apartment on Normandy Avenue, right. and we pulled out to meet the Beatles, and we were reminiscing about that in the back of the cover. It talks about all these instances of Beatlemania, and Bob and I are thinking, you know, that's a movie. There, there's, that's a movie there. What, what if we could make a movie about kids waiting in line to see the Beatles? And that was kind of the American graffiti type of, yes. type of thing with that. So we went and developed some ideas with that, and then we pitched it to these two female producers that we'd met, Alex Rose and Tamara Sayev, mm -hmm. and they were at Warner Brothers, so the project gets set up at Warner Brothers almost mm -hmm. because Warner Brothers execs know that if we can't get the rights to the Beatles' music, there's no movie here. Right. So we had a deal to write a script pending acquisition of these music rights, and it took like eight or nine months mm -hmm. for that to happen. So Bob and I are now down in Mobile while you're shooting Close Encounters, and we're rewriting 1941 for you. And near the end of when we get these rewrites, we get a phone call saying that the music rights got cleared and we could come back to L.A. and write this script. Mm -hmm. Thank God Bob remembers all that. I don't remember any of that. <laughs> I don't remember any of that either. But, uh, but I'm sure it's absolutely no, this, true. It, it, it is. I it's know. true. I, I don't know why I remember. I remember well, stuff. I'm well, sitting here, it's like, it's like watching the extras on a Criterion Collection film <laughs> first before anybody else gets to see it. Exactly. Right. right. Exactly. Right. We were big fans of Frank Capra, Billy Wilder. We were big fans of the Three Stooges uh -huh. and Warner Brothers cartoons and all that manic energy was what we wanted to do. 
the style of comedy that we do, nobody tells jokes. Every character yeah. is taking what they do very seriously. Right. They really want to do this stuff. They are committed to it, and it's just from the audience perspective that it's funny. We wrote everything together. We start by outlining the whole movie on index cards. Mm -hmm. and we have bull and board, and we put these cards up. Oh, I know. A lot of you are wondering about tomorrow night's show. Just who are these youngsters from Liverpool who call themselves the Beatles? We That's knew the opening we scene about. was going to be this Ed Sullivan mm -hmm. uh, salute to Patton, if you will. We knew the kids had to go from New Jersey to New York. We knew that the end of the show was the Beatles' performance. We had all these scenes that we could basically edit mm -hmm. the story by moving these cards around. Mm -hmm. And this one was even more elaborate than we would normally do because we color-coded the cards mm -hmm. with the characters. So we could see immediately, you know, if, if, if the card was blue, it was Pam. And if the card was green, it was it was mm -hmm. rosy. And if the card was yellow, it was grace. Whatever whatever colors, mm -hmm. so we could make sure that we weren't putting two scenes with Pam too close mm -hmm. together, and mm -hmm. just visually see that. And the other little mnemonic that we did when we conceived the script is our four characters in the movie are Grace, Pam, Rosie, and Janice, mm -hmm. and the first initials correspond to the first initials of the Beatles' names. <laughs> There's a good cookie for everybody. That's a cookie that I, it's an Easter egg that I didn't even know Easter. was there to find. Thank you for that. <laughs> you read it and say, Bob, this is a perfect movie for you to direct. Bob said, yeah, Stephen, I know. But Warner Brothers has this policy against first-time directors. So our producers were ready to kind of throw us under the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted Jonathan Demme to direct it. Mm -hmm. And you said... I'm going to slip this over to Scheinberg and Ned right. Tannen at Universal. Right. And you did. It was uh, <laughs> not not a kosher thing to do, actually, but you did it and told them, hey, I believe in this guy Zemeckis and uh, set this project up, and I'll step in if he screws up. Mm -hmm. Did which, you say that? Which, I did. But, it's, but, but, I, but when I said that to them, they didn't read the bylaws of my right. DGA contract. Right. It basically <laughs> right. says a producer cannot step in right. to replace a director. But I just sort of said it to get them <laughs> to let the project go through the, um, through the, the machinery. Process, yeah. the well, listen, i got to take this opportunity to thank you for having the courage to do that because – without mentoring me with those guys, or Sid especially. Sid, yeah. Uh, you know, because that was a, you know, courageous thing to do. Well, you know what it was, Bob? It, it was, to me, it was also something that I did just based on the fact that I knew you and Bob, and I knew what I had was an opportunity not to be a nice guy and give somebody a break, mm -hmm. but to introduce to movies and to audiences a team of guys that understood storytelling, mm -hmm. understood narrative, understood plot, understood interconnecting, how to tell five mm -hmm. an arc of five or six stories at the same time, and and ha have this gang start together, and then they splay out, and they all have their mm -hmm. own adventures, then they come back together at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the perfect structure, and I just thought I was making a contribution to the industry, <laughs> and also to myself, mm -hmm. because I wanted to be in business with right. both of you, right. because I believe in mentorship, and I did feel that I was mentoring both of you, even when we go out to shoot shotguns mm -hmm. on Wednesday night in the dark at the Oak Tree <laughs> right. Gun Club, Right. And we were shooting skeet and trap mm -hmm. together with John Milius a right. lot. These guys were being mentored mm -hmm. by not just me, but by John Milius. We right. both co-mentored the two of you. You did. But here a script came along that I thought was a slam dunk hit. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would benefit all of us. I thought it would be a great break for you, Bob, and also a great break for Universal. Can't thank you enough, Stephen. It was it was a magnificent thing to do, and you know this is like a magnificent mentoring story because it isn't done that much as in in the industry. My entire career, you know, is triggered by that phone call to Sid. So well, I, but I know how it feels because my entire career was triggered by a phone call from Sid's office, <laughs> who saw my movie short film Ablin when I was right. a sophomore at Long Beach State right. College, and asked me to come over to meet him mm -hmm. and offer me a seven-year contract to be a TV director. Yeah. So I know the feeling mm -hmm. when somebody mentors somebody right. else. Right. I've only mentored one person, because I don't think mentorship 
I think you're the, you're the only guys I ever mentored. Mm -hmm. Everything after that is not about mentoring. Mentoring goes deeper than just giving somebody right. a break. Right. It goes with getting to know the people, yeah. hanging out together, having a lot of laughs together, going to restaurants mm -hmm. together, you know, talking about movies together. And so in a sense, De Palma and Coppola and, and Scorsese and myself and George and the whole group, the Northern California, Southern California, New York group, mm -hmm. even though we never worked together, as collaborators, we consistently mentored each other through the 70s and 80s. And that was sort of the only way I can define what mentorship sure, is. Sure, sure. Here we have this Go picture at Universal, mm -hmm. except Warner Brothers doesn't want to let it go because right. they smell money on it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you called up Guy McElwain, Guy your McElwain, agent, my agent yep. uh, and said, Guy, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And Guy went all the way up to Frank Wells, who mm -hmm. was the chairman of the board, right. and said, Frank, come on. Careers are going to get started here, you know. Change your policy. Yeah. Let 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 the project go. If you don't want to make it, let let the movie get made. And and Frank, thank goodness, said, okay. You know, and I knew Frank really well. Not then, but later in life, through Terry Stumble and Bob Daly, I got, got to know Frank really well. And Frank was one of the most decent, honest, and fair people I had ever met in this in this industry. And so it would not be in Frank's character to hold that back from giving you right. a first chance to direct if he wasn't willing to do yeah. it himself. So, so he, he did a very honest and yeah, fair thing. Yeah, it was good fortune that he was there ahead of the studio, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But then it started. We used your casting director, Sally Dennison. Sally Dennison. Right. She was great. She brought in all kinds of great young people. Mm -hmm. Right. Bobby DeChico, I remember this very well. He was working as a doorman at an apartment building in, in West Hollywood because he couldn't get any acting gigs. And when he got the part, Sally drives over there and says, Bobby, you don't have to do this anymore. You got the part. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. That's funny. We found all these all these great people. Wendy Jo Sperber. Wendy Jo Sperber. Wendy Sperber. Sperber. She and, was a revelation. Nancy Allen. Mark Nancy, Nancy had done, Mark, had done yeah. Carrie. Paul you know, Newman's she, daughter. Paul Susan Newman's Newman. daughter. Right. Was, right. Yeah. We had Carrie Fisher in the movie mm -hmm. for about I that. 15 minutes, and right. uh, mm -hmm. she decided that it wasn't for her. But then, of course, the big find of the cast was Eddie Deason. <laughs> Eddie Deason. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Eddie Eddie Deason. Deason. Yeah, Eddie Deason. Well, you know, he was like, he walked in, and he got the part right on the spot. It I was... Mean. The character was based on this kid that I knew back in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a Beatles fanatic. He was a Star Trek fanatic. He was one of these guys where it's like you instantly... You instantly hated him 15 seconds after you met him. That's how intense and crazy he was. <laughs> so in the script, we took all this stuff that he would do and mm. made it the Beatles. And I vividly remember Bob calls me in to see these casting tapes. He says, Bob, I think we found Ringo Klaus. Mm -hmm. And he runs his tape for me. And I was laughing so hard I had tears <laughs> in my eyes. I was just, I, it was just so, right. he was so perfect. That. So we thought about shooting the movie in New York. We scouted the Plaza Hotel, and the expense of doing it that way, mm -hmm. as much as we wanted to do it, I think they said to us, and we had the Beatles here once. Why would we want to recreate that? <laughs> it was, yeah, great. Because it was chaos and mayhem <laughs> exactly. for as long as they stayed exactly. at the plaza, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, which is... And, and also, I was given a very, very tough marching order to keep you guys in line in terms of the cost. Mm -hmm. Universal was only willing to, to put up so much right. negative cost right. and so much P&A. Mm -hmm. And so they, at that time, said, you're responsible for making sure this movie comes in on schedule and on time. And New York was pretty much out. Uh, on the 15th floor of the tower, right. they right. weren't even considering New York at the time. Right. right. So we used that trip as research, mm -hmm. and we hired the production designer. We hired this guy named Peter Jameson, who came from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Roger Corman land, mm -hmm. uh, New World or whatever. He'd done a lot of low-budget movies, uh, and he was great because he understood how to put a lot on the screen with yes. very little money. And we used the Universal back lot, and we used the Warner Brothers back lot. The yes, for, Plaza Hotel mm -hmm. was built on the Warner Brothers back lot. I think it was called the Burbank Studios. Yeah, it was right next to where I crashed the the P40 <laughs> right. in 1941, That's right. That's right. A, a number of years later. That's, That's right. right. That's right. That's, That's right. right. And then the New York Street, uh, we recreated the Ed Sullivan Theater facade That's right. on that theater, mm -hmm. and it was such a good job that people were convinced that we shot the movie in New York. Yeah. I think the other convincing thing about New York City was something that Bob came up with, and that was using steam mm -hmm. coming out of a manholes. Get 
boyfriend? What's the idea of telling that broad I'm your boyfriend? I'm not your boyfriend. But I thought you and me, well, we seem to get along pretty well and all. Yeah, I thought you were in love with Paul. Well, I am, but it's different with Paul. Backlots don't often look like the locations. They, the audience, tough. the They're audience tough. makes the adjustment. Right. They, they, if they like the movie, they they adjust right. for the fact it's not as real as they yeah. have seen New York before. But you made it look so real based on use of nightlight right. and and the use of steam, and also you would use the crowds right to the edge of frame. Yeah. If the camera made a mistake <laughs> and moved a half an inch to the left, you see there would no, there'd be nobody standing there. Right, right. So Bob packed the frame mm -hmm. with the crowd to give the illusion that they were spread out a lot farther than the right. camera could ever capture. The first day of shooting, I couldn't sleep. I got in my car at 3 in the morning, and I drove to location. We were shooting at Pasadena, Pasadena in the mm -hmm. record store. Right. I parked my car. There were like these six 40-foot trailer trucks lined up on the street. Mm -hmm. And that just terrified me because I realized, <laughs> boy, this is real. And there, and, they, and I, I was me and these six teamsters with these forty footers were the only people there. And and I watched them start unloading these trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, remember setting up the first shot with Wendy Jo Sperber looking in the window, the door, and coming into the record store mm -hmm. with all these extras. And we laid out this piece of dolly track. And I remember you showed up and said. You're doing a dolly shot? <laughs> <laughs> and so then what I remember doing the first take, and this was before, you know, mm -hmm. video taps, right. or, you right. know, video assist, so the director stood next to the camera and, and had to see, and, and then asked the camera operator whether we had the shot or not. The and most I, important person on a movie set next to the actors and the director for 70 years of yep. Hollywood history right. is the camera operator, camera the operator. unsung hero. That's right. Of a matter of fact, right. the final word on whether or not they're going to print and move on exactly. or do it again. Right. Exactly, and 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 you had to watch them like a hawk. Mm -hmm. You had to always like keep your eye on them. You know, mm -hmm. so you had to watch that. So a, a, as you learned, you know, you're watching the actor, and then you're feeling the. And if you if you saw the camera magazine make a strange move. Right. You'd have to say, "You sure you got that?" Because yeah, <laughs> you know, cause, you, know you, felt, exactly. you sure you didn't have no to reach for telling. that, you're, you're, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember after doing the first take, it's like all of a sudden this. I okay, now it's my responsibility to decide whether we move on or not. <laughs> Do I have it? You know, it's like okay, well, let's do another one, mm -hmm. and then it's like you know, then all of a sudden the weight of directing. I remember it kind of said, "Okay, this is the real deal. It's not a, it's not a question of all this other stuff. It's deciding when we move on. You know, it's like I have to make that decision at this point." And then the next day, we gathered in the screening room. Mm -hmm. You were already there. We came in from mm -hmm. location. And I remember you made this wonderful <laughs> announcement. You said, all right, Bob, here it is, your first day of dailies, 35-millimeter film <laughs> on the big screen. Here we go. Here we go. Exactly. <laughs> here we go. And it was great because as you were liking things, right, if you, if you liked the way a scene was, you'd say, did you cover that? <laughs> did, you, did you get coverage on that? <laughs> did you cover that? And then, and then if you were asking me if I had coverage, I knew you were. I, you, you, you liked the screen. I said, "Yes, yeah, Steven, it's coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up." <laughs> well, I was well, I was a worried father on this of thing. Course, you know? Of I course, I was the worried dad. I had never executive produced or supervised a production mm -hmm. that I wasn't right. the director of. Right? right. But the assuredness of you on the set knowing what you wanted, knowing what your coverage was going to be, know, knowing exactly where next to put the camera, and then coming into dailies with both of you and seeing how great the stuff was looking. You know, as you got deeper into the schedule, I sort of started to disconnect mm -hmm. from the production and would spend more time in my office or getting my right. other, sure. or the cutting room than I was, you know, lounging around your set. I would come for every big moment. It was fun for me. It was fun right, for me to sure. see all the kids gathered in front of the Plaza Hotel. Right. It was fun to be around some of the frolic and chaos. The original script was called Beatlemania. Right. And there was a live theater show called Beatlemania. <gasps> I remember now. That's right. Mm -hmm. In and New York City, right? tribute show. It was, yeah. It yeah. was, uh, they right. weren't Beatles impersonators. They were that's right. uh, tribute artists. Right. That's, what they, right. that's what they called themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So to we avoid the lawsuits. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So we couldn't use the title Beatlemania. So we changed the title of the script to Beatles Forever, with the mm -hmm. number four dash mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. that you see on some of the signs. And, yeah. and then the legal department of Universal said, you can't use the word Beatles in the title. Mm -hmm. You just can't do mm -hmm. that. Right. So we had to change the title again. 
and it was, I want to hold your hand. But leading up to all this was our friends in the legal department were advising the studio, you know, you shouldn't even make this movie because <laughs> uh, you're depicting the Beatles in it, mm -hmm. and uh, they got enough money to sue the studio. Why take that risk? Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, what all lawyers want to do, minimize risk. Mm -hmm. So we actually had to explain to the lawyers that you weren't really going to see the Beatles right. in these shots. We described the movie as a cross between American Graffiti and Ben-Hur, mm -hmm. because in Ben-Hur, you only saw Jesus from the back of his head. That's right. And, and so you know, we were only going to see the Beatles from the back of their heads. See, see this, is, this, is, this is a company I was keeping in the 70s. This is great. I mean, that's, I totally forgot this story, but I'm now, now I'm remembering all this back and forth. So I actually drew very crude storyboards to show the lawyers, because they right. had no imagination yeah. reading the script, mm -hmm. how we weren't going to see the Beatles. Right, right. And they said, okay, all right, if you shoot it like that, it's okay, it's okay. But there's one thing that you can't do, mm -hmm. one thing that you absolutely cannot do, and that is show the Beatles footage from the Ed Sullivan show at the end of the movie. The way that it is in the movie mm -hmm. is exactly the way that we conceived it and wrote mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But they said, no, you, you can't do that. Even if you get the rights, you can't do it. And I remember Bob and I were agonizing over this, thinking, gee, if we have to cover that whole scene and just play it over the audience mm -hmm. with the Beatles off camera, mm -hmm. you know, the audience is going to tear up the seats in yeah. outrage. You know, talk about coitus interruptus. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just, mm -hmm. we're building up to something and we, and we never get there. But we said, well, we got to go, we got to go for it because when, when are we going to get another chance to make a movie? So we do, we make the movie, we make it that way without mm -hmm. showing the Beatles. And then we show this cut to Sid. And he says, you guys are right. You need that. You need to see the Beatles at the end. You absolutely do. And we're going, well, what about the legal department? And Sid, <laughs> in his great way, he said, ah, screw the legal department. Let's do it. If the Beatles want to sue us, great. I'll be the guy that brought all four Beatles back together in a courtroom, <laughs> and I'll have the movie rights to that trial, and I'll be the guy that reunited the Beatles. <laughs> so yeah, There you go. <laughs> yeah. so, so, classic Sid. Classic <laughs> Sid. So he pushed the button. Right. We we got the money to, to do right, that to right. do the Ed Sullivan stuff. Yeah. We got the rights to the footage. But it was so clever the way you shot that and you directed that by seeing them on the black and white monitors, seeing the Beatles, and in the distance on the stage in color, of sometimes out of focus mm -hmm. are the are, are the impersonators. Right. They rehearse this whole thing about you know mimicking exactly what we saw on the right on the actual footage exactly yeah so that was always, that, that, that was yeah. amazing and yeah. I remember that that gave the third act the reason to be a third act and just a bit of cinema history that might have been the first or one of the first times that we were able to sync video with the camera without having a bar that's right you know that's because right. we actually they they finally figured out mm -hmm. how to sync. Mm -hmm. Television yeah. footage 30 with frame, cameras. Thirty frame video. Thirty frame video. Right. Twenty four right. frame. It was. Uh, right. exactly. It was a guy named Hal Landecker at right. at uh, at the Burbank Studios. Uh -huh. I was given this fantastic opportunity to work with this first AD named Newt Arnold, oh. who's one of the Newt. legendary first ADs that comes back from the That's old right. school of mm -hmm. filmmaking. And Newt, I learned this, th you mm -hmm. know, talking to him every week. He had just come off of making Godfather Part Two mm -hmm. and The Sorcerer with Billy Freakin. And he came to Wally Worsley, who was our production mm -hmm. uh, manager, and said, yeah, I want to go to work, but can I just do something? I've just done these two giant movies mm -hmm. that, like, <laughs> you know, can I just do? He said, well, I got this little movie here, this first-time director that we're doing here. You know, he goes, great, put me on. Now, Newt had a patch over one eye. Right. And he looked like he looked like a pirate. And he had a couple of fingers. He, and he, he had a couple of fingers, fingers that were like blown. blown, blown like he lost a... his eye and his fingers in, it, in, in explosions. <laughs> he was a frontline AD. So he was a frontline AD, and he's so frontline that on the day that we had the three or four hundred screaming girls in front of the Plaza Hotel. I remember him going up to the prop man and said, give me a Colt 45. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what is he? What is he doing? So he straps on this gun with a 40, you know, 45 revolver and it's, you got blanks in it. 
and he gets up on the crane with his megaphone and he starts explaining to the extras, one shot means action, <laughs> two shots mean cut, <laughs> three shots mean go back to number one. And he, so I'm thinking, this is fantastic. So he gets up there, so the gunshot signals were all these screaming girls because there was no other way that they could hear us uh -huh. say cut. And I said, okay, well, I've learned something there. you got to use. I said, this goes back to the days when they were doing westerns out in, you know, uh, Monument Valley. This is how they brought the cavalry back. That was one of my great Newt stories. And the other, oh, the other one, one other one I want to tell you, too, is on my first day of shooting, I was 26 years old. Mm -hmm. So Newt comes up to me and says, did you get breakfast? I said, no, no. He said, go get a breakfast burrito. So I went to the caterer and I said, can I have a breakfast burrito? And he gave me a breakfast burrito and I took it back to the set and the chef ran after me and said, hey, that's a dollar. <laughs> and, Newt, and, and, and Newt said, no, 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 it's the director. It's the director. He goes, oh, he's the director? <laughs> he goes, yeah. That's the old Michael. Was that Michelson's? That was Michelson's. Yeah. You had to pay for everything on the yeah. set. You had to pay for your coffee. Right. Twenty five right. cents for you had, to put, you had a can. Well, that's why they give us something called per diem. Now we give <laughs> these lavish breakfasts to the crew. It's not exactly. you know. It's like unbelievable. In those days, it was like pay for every cup of coffee. Well, tell tell about Nude at the bar. Okay, so Nude. So so again, movie directing one hundred and one. Mm -hmm. Go to the barber shop scene. So Nude said, "Yeah, the actor didn't show up." I said, what? You said the actor who you, you cast as the barber didn't show up. I said, well, Newt, what, <laughs> what am I going to do? We're in downtown Los Angeles. We're in downtown Los Angeles. In middle of the we're lighting the set. Everything, all of a Where sudden, are we going to get an actor? The actor just literally didn't show up Where for work. Where are we going to get another actor? And Newt reaches into his, into his pocket and pulls out his wallet and pulls out his SAG card. And he says, <laughs> every good AD is a member of SAG. I'll get into wardrobe. <laughs> That's amazing. And I, said, I remember that. I said, okay, Newt, go for it. And you can. <laughs> and he's so great because I never would have thought of putting a patch on the barber. He was, I mean, better, was, than like, the, he was better than the guy we better cast. Better than the guy we cast. And he went and did this big stunt at the end. He slips on these gumballs and he said, all right, give me a, give me a tail pad. I'm going to, all right, I'll do this stunt. <laughs> and he goes and does this stunt. Well, the real actor great. shows up about five hours late and he's like drunk or something. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I, I forgot. It. And Newt just ripped him a new one. Yeah, he right. said, you get the hell off this set. If I have anything to do with it, you're never going to work on on one of my shows. Right. It was, it was, it it was, was pretty great. great. Pretty great. And so speaking of having a union card, this is another, another great story. When the movie was a go picture, you said, well, I guess I better join the director's guild. No, no. Sean Daniel, who was our mm -hmm. executive, said, mm -hmm. hey, Bob, uh, you better join the director's guild. I said, oh, yeah, I guess that's something I better do. <laughs> right. So you call it. Go, so go I call up the director's guild and I said, um, uh, I said, so I'm directing this movie at Universal. I need to join the guild. And the, there was a woman on the phone who said, you can't just join the director's guild. And she hung up the phone on me. <laughs> she hung you up, can't just say you're you directing a movie. You can't just say movie. you're directing a movie. And she hung up the phone. And I decided, decided well, then I'm not going to join. And, and, so then a couple, and, I, and then I think I directed, what, three movies? I yeah, think, I think yeah. I directed. Wait a second. You directed. I want to hold your hand. <laughs> use cars and romancing the stone without being a DGA member. Right, and then I got. And I, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. And no way. No. No. And then no. And you know how I. And then I got somebody. Somebody. Mm -hmm. My business manager got a call and right. said, "The Directors Guild is looking for you. You're on their list of dead directors." Holy. <laughs> no. They said they've got all these residual checks sitting. In the <laughs> I said, "Oh, I guess I better join the directors guild now." <laughs> I had no idea you went you went three for zero at the director's Three guild. for zero. But You're lucky there's a statute of limitations that has expired. But we're very happy to have you now. Bob. Oh yeah, no, I, I understand. Well, it's one of those. It's it's crazy because you call you call you say I want to join the union. I want to give you some money, and they say. Get out of here, kid. Right. <laughs> when you won the DGA award for Forrest Gump, that would have been a great story to I tell. I should have told that story. You should have told yeah, that yeah, story, except for your DGA exactly. award. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Well, so we make the movie with the Beatles. Finally, we have we have a cut, and, and we run the movie at the Directors Guild, as a matter right. of fact, Directors mm -hmm. Guild Theater. Yeah. It, it was our, our first screening with, with an audience, and it was... Bedlam, great. I, I'll tell you what it was like from my point of view, because I was there, and I also was there at the very first screening of American Graffiti because of my relationship with George. And um, and the only experience I had with an out-of-control 
audience, preview audience, was when people saw American Graffiti for the first time, and they went nuts. And I wasn't sure I'd ever hear anything like that again until the night of the screening for I Want to Hold Your Hand, where I heard a similar reaction from that audience. We had always talked about this being kind of a cousin mm -hmm. to American Graffiti. Right. And, and that reaction was incredible. Yeah. So we were feeling really great. This is about a week or two before the movie's going to open, and um, nobody tells us to make any changes at the studio. They're all, they're all real happy. But our advertising and publicity budget is less than the movie cost. Mm -hmm. Because when the first budget came in, the movie was budgeted two and a half. I think we made it for two six, two seven when all was done. And the advertising budget comes in and it's two and a half million dollars. And somebody at the studio says, we can't spend as much to promote this movie as a movie cost. <laughs> you get a million dollars to, to promote this thing. <laughs> so it's like, what are, we, what are you going to do with a million dollars? Even in 1978, that, that wasn't a lot mm -hmm. of money to, mm -hmm. to promote, right. promote a movie. So we also had the guy who was running distribution at Universal, Hi Martin. You remember I High do Martin? very well. Uh, Southern guy. Mm -hmm. And we get the release plan, and, and we're looking at, at this, and we're opening in Murrieta, Georgia, on the same day that we're opening in New York City. And, you know, we're thinking, well, this is a movie that's going to play much better in urban areas than rural. Mm -hmm. and, I, and we're having a meeting with them. I said, why are we opening in rural Georgia at the same time in New York City? You know, haven't you seen this movie? And Hi Martin says, no, I haven't seen the movie. I don't need to see a movie to know how to book it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We Those were the trouble. days. Those were the days. <laughs> and, as, and I think that's where you came up with the line that Burkhead says to Matheson all through 1941, am I in trouble now? That's right. And I think exactly. we all felt collectively, exactly. may, that might be where the line came that's from, right. are we in trouble now? It was yeah. a good experience. We learned, I learned my experience there, which is that, you know, you know, that uh, making your movie is 50% of the job. And then the other 50% of the job is releasing it. And That's it, right. And, you know, and that was an important lesson to learn is that you just don't always have this giant machine behind you, even though you think, you know, mm -hmm. you're driving onto this lot with mm -hmm. all these stages mm -hmm. and there, you you know, but you, you, you've got to work, you got to work both ends of that, exactly. that, that whole. So the movie, the movie opens in, in April, 1978, and it's, it's basically dead on arrival. We get a lot of really good, good, good reviews, mm -hmm. but the campaign wasn't, wide enough to let people know about this movie uh and nobody went and you know bob and i are totally totally depressed and the, the monday after you know and we get the final you know we're 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 dead and we're sitting at bob's apartment in burbank and the phone rings and bob answers well no 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 i gotta tell you because I, no, no, okay. okay. I know this story <laughs> vividly no 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 we dragged into the office and we so were sitting in our office on the lawn, oh, right. and it's like 10.30 in the morning. Our assistant says, Bob, Lou Wasserman is on the phone. And I looked at Bob, and I thought... Oh man, thought he's gonna, gonna he's gonna us. he's going to he's going to order me to my execution, <laughs> right? Lou Washman is, by the way, the supreme Allied commander of MCA Universal, right. right? And the sort of patriarch of the entire movie industry. Right. So I get on the phone, and I didn't even let mm -hmm. her, let him get a word in edgewise. I'm said, uh, "Hi, uh, Mr. Wasserman, I'm I'm, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry." I, I start apologizing uh -huh. for the box office of the movie. He goes, "Robert, Robert, stop, stop." I ran that picture for my grandkids over the weekend at the house, and they loved it. And I thought the picture was terrific. I'm really proud that we made that film. <laughs> and he said, I want you to do two things for me today. I said, what's that? He said, I want you to leave the office, go home right now, and drink some whiskey. <laughs> and he said, and then I want you to come back tomorrow, and let's get going on the next one. Nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. Nothing better I than mean, that. you don't get calls you like that from no, studio executives no, you don't. today. No, that, like that. I mean, a, that lot is like, a lot has changed. A lot has, a lot it's, has it's, changed. It's, all, it's always been Sid and Lou's philosophy, because when I first went to, when Sid first called me, I was in college, he right. saw my film Amblin, and he right. called me up to come see him. And when he offered me a seven-year contract to become a term television director right. at Universal, and I was really young, I was like 21, 22 years old, uh, I'd have to drop out of school, of course, but I was right. so polaxed and stunned right. and, and by this offer. I couldn't believe that I was hearing these words. I didn't respond right away. 
And I think that Sid, who's later told me that he uh, he assumed I had had multiple offers from other <laughs> studios based on that short film Amblin. Right. So he took my pause as doubt mm -hmm. that I would uh, accept his offer. <laughs> so the next thing he said, I'll never forget. And it echoes, I think, what Wasserman was mm -hmm. intending to say to you. Yeah. He said, Sid said to me, sir, <laughs> if you sign with us, I will stand behind you and support you just as much in failure as I will in success. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll never forget those words. Yeah. And of course, I finally got, was able to find my voice <laughs> and I said, thank you, and of course. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell one other of my favorite Stephen stories on this. When we were shooting the crowd stuff at the Ed Sullivan Theater, Bob has this idea during all the bedlam Let's have a girl faint and roll down these stairs. And our production manager says, it's not in the budget. Can't do it. And Bob... It was a stunt girl. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Leslie Hoffman, who was, who was uh, Wendy's Wendy's stunt, 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 stunt double. Yeah. Terrific lady. She's still around. Yeah. So Bob turns to Stephen and says, Stephen, you know. And Stephen turned to Wally and said, it's a great idea, Wally. If the studio isn't going to pay for it, I'll pay for it. You send a bill to me. <laughs> Bob, do the stunt. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Every day. That's great. And it was a great lesson because yeah. as a producer, and I think mm -hmm. Bob as a director, we learned that, because Stephen, you said us, mm -hmm. the studio will be too humiliated right. to actually send me a bill. Exactly. For this. Exactly. Uh, that'll, that'll but I would happen. have gladly paid had they yeah, sent yeah. me a bill. But I think we're going to lean on you, too, to get a crane. <laughs> for that scene too. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, to get a Chapman crane right. for that day where we had all those extras because that wasn't in the budget and they weren't going to pay for that. And I think I had to lean on you and said, yeah. you know, I need And I said, I'll pay for the crane, I'll pay for the three <laughs> right. operators. And, and, and I was willing to do this, but eventually when the studios heard that I was going to foot the bill for these overages, so we can't let, we can't they, let, that, we can't they, let filmmakers pay for their own They movies. did the right thing. Right. And so that, that was something yeah. that we learned right. when, when, when you were up right. against it and you say, look, Right. We're going to do it, and I'll pay for it if you don't. Right, right. And then what are they going to say? Look, and here's the thing about Steven as a producer. This is the great gift for us as filmmakers. The fact that you're a director makes you a great mm -hmm. producer because you know what the director is doing. You know how movies are made. And, you know, we've all worked with magnificent producers in our history, mm -hmm. but sometimes they say really crazy <laughs> stuff, you know, like stuff that makes, like, no sense. But that is something that never comes from you because you know exactly the process and you don't just say, you know, you know, you say, and you understand where, you know, you understand what's valuable, and what's not valuable and what's important, what isn't important. And it's not just looking at numbers and whatever no, no. and doing things. So that's really, that it, was really great to have you as a, as a producer on my first movie. It, it, I can't tell you. To, to be yeah. a director and then my, my, the first time producing, what I bring to that is I'm an empath because I've been there. Exactly. And I've been through my first right. and my second and my third. And I know what it feels like to, right. to have, a, have an idea of what to do. And there's, there's a bunch of obstacles that right. get in your way from being able to accomplish right. that or be able right. to achieve that. And sometimes it just takes an empathic person. And that person right. in this situation was somebody who was also a director. Right. But in other situations, there are very empathic producers mm -hmm. who understand you know, that um, they need to fight the fight for new, for, right. for new directors. It's all about trust. So once I choose someone to direct a film as a producer, my job is to let them direct the film. And, and you certainly and, do that with me. And, 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 and because you had so many ideas in the middle of production that weren't in the screenplay, because mm -hmm. that's the process. It's mm -hmm. fluid. It's right. never, you know, we're not accepting a biblical, Talmudic, chiseled in stone uh, a manuscript. This is something that e is evolving based on an act idea an actor has, an idea the sound person has, an idea the DP has, an idea that the, the writers have and, and the director has, right. and making it better and evolving it somewhere. And and if you if you get too authoritarian uh, from a studio's point of view about not letting the director direct, right, and 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 not letting the vision be fluid, then you're going to wind up with a very uh, you know you're going to wind up with less right. than you bargained for. Well, in the case of letting the filmmaker have his vision, you certainly did for me. I, I, mean, I, I, so, and I believed in your vision. Yeah, well, and... As and, I did on used cars. And, exactly. And, and, and back exactly. to future films. Right, exactly. All of them. And all of them, yeah. All of them, absolutely. Exactly. There can only be one warden in a madhouse. <laughs> and that warden's got to be the director, not the producer. <laughs> That's right. That's a perfect way, a perfect way of putting it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Having 
Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis as a part of my life as friends and as colleagues and as buddies has been one of the greatest honors that I've, 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 I've had. And the honor is that we still know each other. Mm -hmm. My honor is the fact that we're still interactive. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that you're doing mm -hmm. Back to the Future on stage for mm -hmm. the first time as a musical. The fact of the matter is that we've collaborated on right. so many things. The fact of the matter is that this screening room that we're taping this interview is the screening room that Bob first showed me, Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. And I sat right in, the, in that middle chair, and Bob, you were right behind me. Mm -hmm. And I was alone in the room with Bob and Mayor behind me. And when the movie was over, I was overcome with emotion. Mm -hmm. I overcome with, in, with pride. Mm -hmm. You had made the greatest film of your career up to that point. And I just couldn't find the words. And so you were so nervous that I didn't like the movie because I wasn't saying anything <laughs> when the lights came up. You said, okay, I get it. You hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Until I turned around and he saw my face and I was just dripping with tears. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's true. there's been so much wonderful yeah. fallout from the first time yeah. we met at USC and then in my office at Universal. Yeah. And it, it, it just will continue into the future. The fact that Forrest Gump exists, the fact that Back to the Future exists, the fact that all these movies that I've had... You know, that, that the, our careers the exist. honor, it's, the it's honor really, to, to do absolutely. Uh, exists only because of that very first call that you made to to Sid. And, we, you know, we couldn't be more, more grateful, grateful and yeah. honored, honored ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. And if Sid were here, I would just uh, uh, pay it back and basically say, and I exist because Sid Scheinberg found me out of film school based on yeah. a short film I made. So it all is all, linked up. It all goes around. It all goes yeah. around.